Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the Sunderland Public Library on behalf of the Library's Board of Directors and our director, Dr. Gumstock, who will be here a little bit later this morning. I welcome you all today to this morning's program. Um, my, my name is Aaron Felbel. I'm the head of adult services here at the Sunderland Public Library, and I'm also a member of the Sunderland Energy Committee along with Laura William and Meg Fisher. Our chair, David Goodwin, is out of town and he regrets not being here this morning. It is my privilege to introduce our own state representative, Natalie Blay, who has worked on behalf of the residents of Western Massachusetts in various public positions for well over a decade. She was sworn into office as the first female state representative for the 1st Franklin District in January 2019. Smartest move, people. <laughs> and Natalie proudly represents one of the most rural districts in the Commonwealth that includes 18 communities spanning three counties and over 450 square miles. <laughs> Natalie is the vice chair of the Joint Committee on Agriculture, and she is also a member of the Joint Committees on Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development, Transportation, and Ways and Means. Prior to becoming state representative, Natalie served as a congressional aide to U.S. Representatives John Oliver and Jim McGovern for a decade. She went on to become University of Massachusetts Amherst Chancellor Kumbul Subswami, first chief of staff, and she also served as the executive director of the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce. Now, perhaps her crowning achievement, I must mention, <laughs> is that she was also a member of this library's board of trustees, <laughs> during which time she served as the chair for the search committee that brought us our current director, Kathleen Hans, yes. and Kathy Umstadt, which I think is the best thing to happen she to this Arlington like Library, library in its history. <laughs> Natalie earned a BA in political science from Dickinson College in Carlisle, Carlisle Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and an MA in organizational and political communication from Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts. After being awarded the Cecil and Helen Rose Ethics, Ethics and Communications Scholarship. That's a good thing to have. <laughs> so please let me, please join me in welcoming Natalie Blake, who will then introduce our other guest today, Chair um, Roy, who is the chair of the House House Chair of the Joint Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to have you all here at the Sunderland Public Library, which, as Aaron noted, has a special place in my heart. Um, and I want to thank the Sunderland Energy Committee for hosting us here, as well as the Sunderland Public Library for giving us this beautiful space at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I am really excited to have the chair of the TUE Committee here today, Jeff Roy. i give you a little bit of background on the chair. He was appointed chairperson of TUE in 2021. He previously served as chair of the Joint Committee on Higher Education and as acting chair of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Finance. I do just want to say one thing about Chair Roy that I learned when he was chair of higher education is that he makes it a point to travel across the Commonwealth to talk with individuals about uh, what is important to them, and he has continued that work as the chair of TUE, and you can see that just by the fact that he's here today. Uh, since 2013, he has been part of a legislative team that has addressed issues on education, economic development, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, health care, substance abuse disorder, criminal justice, civil rights, and so much more. He has led the effort to draft and pass the Clean Energy and Offshore Wind Bill in 2022, which I think you will all agree was a tremendous win for the Commonwealth, for the region, for our nation. Uh, he drafted and passed the Genocide Education Act. He finalized the Roadmap Bill on Climate Change in 2021. I just want to recognize that I've been in office for five years and we have already passed two omnibus climate bills in a short time, a short period of time. He has drafted and passed legislation relative to sexual violence on higher education campuses. 
and drafted and passed legislation increasing transparency and financial reporting requirements for higher education institutions. He is a 1986 cum laude graduate of Boston College Law School. He received his undergraduate degree from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. Um, and he's, I just want to speak to him as a person, if I could, for, for one heartbeat of a second. Um, as elected officials, uh, people sometimes lose track of the fact that we're also human beings. And I have had the privilege of getting to know Chair Roy as a human being. He sits behind me to the left, on the end. <laughs> um, and he's just, from the very beginning, been tremendously accessible. Uh, he is a phenomenal listener and has the ability to take in tremendous amounts of information. And we've seen that with the omnibus climate bills that he's been able to pull together and to build the coalitions necessary to get those bills across the finish line, uh, working with both House and Senate members and individuals across the Commonwealth. So I really, it is a, it is a true honor to work with him uh, in the building. I am phenomenally grateful to him for making the trip out here to Western Massachusetts to be here with you today. I do also want to note that he is a frequent pan ammer. Is that what you refer to yourself as? Pan masser. Pan masser. Yeah, I won't go pan. I won't go across America. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go across Massachusetts. How many times have you done the pan mass challenge? This will be my 23rd year. 23rd year. Wow. wow. He also is an EV driver, and like me, fights for the nine, well, you have a dedicated spot, but uh, there are only <laughs> nine <I> share. <laughs> that you do share very well. There are only nine EV charging stations in the parking garage that we park in, in the state house, uh, and he is fighting to get more. More than there are in Alewife. we <laughs> 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 all the rest of us here. <laughs> so he's working to get us more chargers there. He is also a member of a band, plays guitar? Yes. I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> um, just an all-around phenomenal person, and I'm really grateful to him for taking the time to be here today. Uh, so the way that this is going to work is Chair Roy is going to give remarks about the committee's work and what he is working on, and then we'll open it up to questions. We do have to wrap up at about 5 of uh, 10 so that he can get to UMass, where we're having the 21st Century Ag Commission hearing today. Uh, for those of you who are interested in agriculture, uh, the 21st Agriculture Committee was created to look at the future of agriculture in the Commonwealth, and they've been having hearings across the state, and we're lucky to have them here at UMass today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chair Wright, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Natalie. And uh, when I said the smartest move you did was sending uh, Natalie to the State House, I meant it because uh, uh, one of the nice things about this particular job is you do get to travel uh, around the Commonwealth if you choose. I mean, you can stay in your district and do, uh, uh, do that work. But uh, I, I do appreciate the ability and opportunity to go to uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, Natalie has invited me several times to come out here. In fact, we ate, I don't know the name of the restaurant. Blue Heron. Yeah. He went to the Blue, Blue Heron. Heron. <laughs> I had one of the best meals I've had uh, in a long time uh, there. But uh, she is incredibly, an incredible champion. And before I get into what I want to talk about today, let me tell you uh, from the 2022 legislation that we did, uh, driving clean energy and offshore wind, there was a provision in there to me, which is one of the most exciting uh, provisions, and that was the formation of a Grid Modernization Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. And that led to some transformational changes in looking at infrastructure that we need uh, to reach our goals and to get the utilities to come up with five and 10 year plans, which had never been done before. And that language was authored by your state representative. Oh, the, uh, as a matter of fact, there's even uh, in the Greenfield, uh, what is your paper out here? Daily Hampshire Gazette. The Hampshire Gazette. The Hampshire Gazette. Gazette uh, Chris has a Greenfield recorder. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the Hampshire Gazette, because I was reading my emails this morning, did a story uh, about uh, solar 
and they talked about uh, the Green, uh, Grid Modernization Advisory Council and uh, were applauding the uh, administration, the Healy administration, for the great work putting that together. And I said, no, no, it was Natalie Blay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so we corrected the record. Um, so a couple things I want to talk about. First of all, I want to talk about uh, offshore wind, because to me, uh, that's one of the most exciting uh, things that uh, I've been able to work on as a legislator, and I'm from the community of Franklin, Massachusetts, not to be confused with Franklin County. Um, and we don't have much uh, offshore wind capabilities in Franklin, Massachusetts. Uh, we have one little pond, uh, and I don't think it could accommodate uh, the turbines that are, that are out there, but uh, um, I've seen in the offshore wind industry an opportunity for the, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts not, that's unmatched by anything else uh, that we can do. 20 miles off the coast of Massachusetts, off of Martha's Vineyard, is some of the most robust wind in the entire contiguous United States. And it happens to be located in shallow uh, water in that particular area of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And for us not to take advantage of the opportunity to harness that wind and turn it into power uh, would be shameful. And we have not wasted any time uh, in getting that uh, project up and moving. We've hit some bumps along the way, uh, but uh, you know what? We're overcoming those bumps. Uh, first power coming to the grid was generated on January 2nd of uh, 2024. Uh, I, re I was interviewed by uh, State House News, uh, a reporter who said, are you disappointed that uh, that uh, Vineyard Wind did not reach the goal of uh, first power by December 31st of 2023. <laughs> and I was sitting there, I'm like, no, absolutely not. I said, uh, I know it's on the way. I said, I took a boat out there a couple months ago. I saw the, uh, the structures in the water. I know it's happening. Uh, it's, it's imminent that we're going to have this first power. That was January 2nd of 2024, about 4 p.m. And it was uh, at 11, uh, I believe 11.57 p.m. on that day that the first power was generated. So the, uh, the reporter did uh, send me a note the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good call on him. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's incredible that that project continues to go. Uh, right now it's powering uh, enough power for 30,000 homes. When the project is complete, 62 turbines, it'll be enough for three to 400,000 homes. And that's just the first uh, of the projects that we have going out in the wind, uh, going out in that area of the state. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, the bids came in for the next round of offshore wind, uh, and Massachusetts went big uh, in this round. We uh, did the largest procurement in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, seeking up to 3,600 megawatts of offshore wind. Uh, to put that in perspective, Vineyard Wind 1, which is out there right now, uh, is 800 megawatts. So we, we uh, saw four times that amount. Keep in mind, we lost 2,400 megawatts when Avon Grid and South Coast uh, Wind uh, failed. And you know, they failed because uh, there was a war in Ukraine and there was a supply chain issue, there was a pandemic, uh, any number of activities that just uh, made proceeding with those projects economically impossible. But they're back at the table as of Wednesday, both Avon Grid both, and South Coast Wind, which I think is now known as Ocean Wind. These guys changed their names uh, so many times. Uh, uh, I have a vineyard uh, wind hat that's now a collectible. <laughs> but, uh, you know, every day they come up with uh, uh, new names, but uh, they're, they're moving forward. And that package that uh, came out Monday uh, met the 3,600 uh, uh, megawatt goal that we set forth uh, for the procurement. And it was part of a regional collaboration with Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, seeking 6,000 megawatts of offshore wind. Um, Massachusetts got all 3,600, I'm not sure Connecticut and Rhode Island got uh, the additional 2,400 uh, they want, but I don't represent uh, Connecticut or Rhode Island, do you? <laughs> so I'm happy with uh, the results there. Uh, before diving into this work, uh, the, the House 
uh, produced a comprehensive 100-page uh, report with analysis and uh, recommendations uh, that we uh, prepared moving in, into this direction, and that formed the, uh, the nucleus for the Offshore Wind and Clean Energy Act that we uh, put out in 2022. And uh, it's also led to some investments in ports, uh, both in uh, New Bedford and Salem, but also uh, the town of Somerset, Massachusetts. And the beauty of the town of Somerset, Massachusetts, Somerset, Massachusetts at Brayton Point was the home to the last coal-fired plant in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And when those towers came down uh, uh, in an implosion, uh, you know, boats were out there, everybody was watching and celebrating the end of an era uh, of coal-fired energy in Massachusetts. The poetry is that that site, uh, within the next couple of years, will be the home of a manufacturing facility by a company, an Italian company known as Prismium, that's going to manufacture all of the cables for all of the offshore wind farms that are along the east coast of the United States of America. Wow. Imagine that poetry turning wow. that site, the last coal-fired plant, to a site that's going to produce, help us produce the clean energy that we need uh, to achieve our goals. Talk to you about uh, the Grid Modernization Advisory Council that led to some uh, great reports coming out of the industry, giving us an idea of what uh, infrastructure is going to be needed uh, over the next uh, several uh, decades. Uh, our electrification needs are, are going to nearly double over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Double what we produce now. And we don't have a grid that has the capability of doing all that work today. So grid modernization uh, is uh, incredibly important uh, for that work. I did neglect poor Salem. I don't want to do that uh, uh, because there's also some poetry there. Uh, they had a coal-fired plant on their port that was closed several years ago to bring in a natural gas plant. But when they built that natural gas plant, they gave it a 50-year lease. So that gas plant is going to be out of business, uh, I believe, by 2050. Uh, and uh, by that time, the port in Salem, which we're making hundreds of millions of dollars of investments in, will become the site of, uh, of uh, offshore wind uh, investments and construction uh, over the next uh, several decades. So it's an amazing set of progress that we have made. And uh, my colleagues from New Bedford uh, call me frequently and say, uh, Jeff, you need to come down to New Bedford to see what's happening on the port. And one of them who was born and raised in New Bedford, and he's been in the uh, legislature over 20 years, said, I have never seen such economic activity in my life than what I'm seeing uh, as a result of this offshore wind industry. And, uh, you know, we talk frequently about the fact that 100 years ago, uh, the city of New Bedford, New Bedford was providing lights uh, through the use of whale oil, and that was their big industry. And today, they can be the city of lights because of the offshore wind industry. And that's just a tremendous progress uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and uh, a real uh, demonstration that if we put our minds to it, we can have economic prosperity at the same time we're producing the clean energy that is necessary for us to achieve our goals of net zero by 2050. Um, I would also say that uh, that Vineyard Wind project uh, has been great in terms of uh, economic development for that community, but also for uh, groups in that community. Uh, they have, uh, Vineyard Wind has a policy of look local first, so they're buying their materials uh, from folks who are local to the extent that they're produced there. They are uh, doing project labor agreements with the unions there to provide good paying jobs for people uh, who live and want to work uh, in that particular area. 
and uh, they have these uh, meet the buyer sessions where they tell what they're going to be looking for over the next uh, several years so that people who may be interested in starting a business or getting uh, you know, into uh, that field have an opportunity to uh, participate in that. And it's a buy local and uh, sell local initiative. Uh, and the most important thing that I can say that we can do is to continue along that path. And uh, the procurements that we saw uh, this week are a prime example that uh, we are continuing to head in the right direction. We need as much wind power as we can get. Uh, all of the lease areas that are off of uh, the coast of Martha's Vineyard, if we uh, directed all of that wind power towards the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it would be enough to power every home and business in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're going to share it with New York. <laughs> but uh, just know that uh, the capabilities are out there. The president set a national goal of 11 gigawatts of wind by 2030, and Massachusetts is already poised to provide six of those gigawatts. The small state of Massachusetts is prepared to uh, uh, produce uh, over half of what the president set as a national goal. That's pretty incredible for the small state of Massachusetts. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so um, we're going to continue to push for these uh, energy improvements in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, we're already looking at uh, some legislation for 2024 so that Natalie can come back to you in a few months and say, in my five years in the legislature, we have done three, three. major pieces <laughs> of, uh, of energy and uh, climate change legislation. And, uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that uh, that can happen. I'm actively uh, working uh, with my Senate co-chair, contrary to what you may have read in the tabloids. Uh, uh, we do work together. Uh, we actually share philosophy about where Massachusetts should go and uh, should be by 2050, but we don't necessarily share the method in how we get there. But uh, we're aligned on the principles, so uh, we can work out the bugs uh, in the interim, and uh, uh, we're making every effort to do that. We uh, put out 42 bills on February 7th. I bet you nobody in this room knows that the, the TUE committee released 42 bills. I, uh, I do. You did? <laughs> All right. Uh, because uh, uh, one of the Globe reporters came in to my office a couple of weeks ago and he said, you know, what is this rift between uh, you and the senator? I said, hey, you know, we just have uh, uh, our disagreements, but we're getting the work done and we, we kicked out 42 bills just uh, two weeks ago. He said, what do you mean? He said, I didn't hear anything about that. He said, I'm ashamed. I'm a Globe reporter. I didn't see it. Well, I'm glad that you guys are more ashamed uh, than the Globe. Um, but uh, we're looking at, so I did say we need infrastructure in place. So siting and permitting of the infrastructure that's going to be necessary to do all these projects is something that we're working on very closely. Um, I actually filed a bill, H3215, which was one of the 42 that was released from the committee, is a uh, piece of that conversation about how we can uh, properly site the infrastructure that's necessary to get all of this uh, work going. Um, the governor appointed a commission uh, on siting and permitting. I, I had the great honor to serve as a member of that commission. And breaking news for you today, that report will come out today. So uh, get, your, uh, get your hands on a copy of that report, because uh, uh, today is uh, March 29th. The legislature wanted it by March 31st. And, uh, since that's Easter Sunday, they're going to do it by uh, Good Friday. 11.57 <laughs> p.m. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that uh, is an important piece. Let me just go through uh, as quickly as I can because I know that uh, folks here will have questions and happy to answer questions. But uh, that package uh, includes, we did uh, five 
many omnibus bills uh, from the House side of the, the project, uh, and one of them is an, an act relative to clean energy generation, which is calling for um, a new procurement of 9.45 million uh, uh, megawatt hours of clean energy resources. That's not just wind, uh, that can be solar, that can be hydro. We're even going to entertain uh, thoughts of buying nuclear energy from Connecticut and New Hampshire uh, because they have, uh, they could, well, I know, thumbs down, I, I can see it over there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it's being produced. It'll be produced for the next 20 or 30 years. It's cheap, it's clean, and it's an opportunity for us to use it as a transition fuel as opposed to oil, natural gas, or coal, which some countries uh, still use it to this day. So um, we're gonna give the opportunity for and the authorization to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to buy from either Millstone or Seabrook, we're not calling for the, the, uh, the construction of uh, more nuclear plants. So we're saying, hey, it's out there. Uh, it's going to help us make our transition uh, to uh, net zero. So uh, keep that in mind. Oh. We're also looking at trying to bring the prices down to the offshore wind. So instead of uh, only allowing 20 year contracts, with, we're going to expand them to 30 years, allow the developers to amortize the pricing over 30 years as opposed to 20, so that will drive the uh, cost down. We're gonna set a 10,000 uh, 10, megawatt solar target uh, by 2030, and uh, we're going to set a target of 4,500 megawatts for storage uh, uh, for when the wind's not blowing and when the sun's not shining, and uh, we're gonna push along in those directions uh, we're going to re, uh, remove uh, barriers for uh, low-income folks to get uh, solar uh, at their homes, and we're going to try to get as much on rooftops and, and parking lots uh, as possible and, uh, to move into that direction. I've already talked, talked about the siting and permitting. Uh, that bill is out there. We're also going to do an act to promote uh, uh, transportation electrification infrastructure. Um, I am the author of a blog called rangeanxieties.com, so uh, <laughs> if you want to see some humorous uh, electric vehicle driving stories, and, and uh, Natalie has promised me a piece. Promised. Uh, that, uh, blog. Since I've rolled into yeah. my house with five miles left. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's one of those things I say, you know, I've been an electric vehicle operator since 2012, and uh, I've seen uh, the, the highs and lows of operating an electric vehicle, and I try to share some of those highs and lows uh, through the blog to give people uh, an understanding uh, of what's involved. And I say that if they had to go through some of the uh, rather uh, horrible lows that are involved in driving an EV, no one's going to drive an EV. Unless we do this better, and provide you with alewife uh, uh, station uh, and stations all over. I want to see all these gas stations converted to electric vehicle uh, charging places, and I want to see that in my lifetime. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young. I look around the <laughs> I fit in pretty good. But you know, we all want to see this in, in our lifetime. So that particular uh, bill, which contains a number of uh, pieces is going to help move us into that uh, direction. We are also looking at municipal uh, aggregation plans. Uh, we think that DPU went a little slow on approving those plans. We want every community in the Commonwealth to be able to participate in these plans. So we uh, are pushing DPU in that direction. And uh, believe it or not, DPU has responded and has made some major changes over the last uh, couple of months. So uh, we keep pushing on those. And uh, I know that competitive retail supply is uh, uh, a more indiv individualized uh, notion of municipal aggregation. Uh, and there's a lot in the press uh, about that particular topic. Uh, we're working on legislation to get rid of the bad actors in that space because I couldn't agree uh, more that there are bad actors in that space, but uh, not to the point where I want to eliminate an entire industry because of those few bad actors. So uh, you'll see that debate uh, taking place uh, over the next several weeks. 
So I think that gives you uh, an overview of uh, what's uh, going through uh, our minds. Uh, up at the legislature, and I do want to thank you again for sending Natalie because she comes up with some of the best ideas uh, for these bills. <laughs> She's a great partner to have in the legislature. Yeah.